Today, we're talking about focus for healing and growth in a hyper-connected world. Many of us struggle to focus our attention, and for good reason, and it's only gotten worse over the past few decades. Today, we're going to be exploring why. <laughs> What's, why is this happening? What's causing it? And what we can do to focus our attention, because whether we need to study or if we have goals or objectives that we need to achieve, maybe it pertains to our work. In order to be effective, we need to be able to focus. I'm Ben Ufana, so let's get into it. I'm going to start out with sharing some examples of my own personal experience over the years and experience working with people and the changes that I'm noticing as I look, I can't help but notice as I look around and as I'm working with people one-on-one -on -one and in groups. So starting out back in 1994, it's, it's been a while, but a friend invited me to come stay with her in Boston, her and her husband. And she set up a radio interview for me at the Boston College radio station with one of the uh, on-air personalities and and then a corresponding speaking engagement. And so even while I was still in the midst of the interview, I, <laughs> the phone is ringing off the hook. <laughs> and because we didn't have cell phones in those days, I gave her home phone number. And so the calls continued to come in. And the remainder of the day and even into the following days. And so my schedule filled up fairly quickly. And I was still living in New Mexico at the time, but I would make trips from New Mexico back to the East Coast. I'd stop in Boston and I'd go down to New York City. And I would come into town and my schedule would be full. I would have two to three weeks of appointments and whatever openings I had, the majority of them filled up. So I would be working, as I said, two to three weeks on end, no days off, and usually working about nine hours a day doing sessions for people. And so by the time I would leave town, I would be feeling dead exhausted. But yeah, I was very grateful to be so busy. And I was especially appreciate the commitment and consistency that I found in people at that time because you know, I would have a lot of the same people just continuing to come back indefinitely, I mean, like for years. And in many instances, they would show up with certain concerns or presenting issues, and yet those issues would either have made tremendous headway, we'd made a lot of progress, or they would, in some instances, had completely resolved themselves. And yet, it would be helping them in so many different areas of their health and the relationships and other aspects of their lives. And so many of these people opted to continue to work with me. And so I'd get into town. And what was so amazing is that as I'd be working with someone, I'd schedule the next appointment for my next visit three months later. And some people were stacking up two, three sessions at a time. And each session would initiate that next stage of the healing process. And when people would stack the sessions, like two, three, or more, the process would be amplified and it would be that much more intense. But what happened is that people would schedule these sessions and during the coming weeks and months, it would initiate this ongoing process. So people were continuing to heal after they got off the table, after her, her initial session or sessions, plural. And this process would continue, as I said, for weeks or months. And then I'd get back into town. 
Now, the majority of people would keep the appointments that they scheduled at the time that they were scheduled months prior. So I'd get into town and I would just call people as a reminder and say, yeah, I'll see you at this time this day. And when they'd come back in, they would be telling me, you know, that first they'd remember everything that had occurred in the previous session. Then they'd be sharing with me what had occurred in the following weeks and months between the sessions. And so again, there was this continuity. And so we would just pick up where we left off. And it was so gratifying to work with people in those days. But things began to change. When I first landed in Boston, we had dial-up internet. But dial-up internet was painfully slow. You had to sit there for indefinite periods of time, just waiting for web pages to, uh, to, uh, to open up. And it's frustrating. And you couldn't do anything with it unless you're just sitting there right in front of your computer. So people didn't spend that much time online in those days. And the internet didn't have quite so much to offer either. As the years passed, the technology quickly developed. We got cell phones and then social media, uh, Facebook. I think that was 2004. And dating apps actually preceded that. I think there was Match.com. And some years after that, there was Hinge and Bumble and Tinder. The technology has continued to advance. And so there's more social media sites and news and all this online digital content that has emerged. And it's become a lot more highly developed than what it started out with. But what a lot of people don't realize or fail to comprehend is that all this digitized online content, it operates and the platforms that hosts this content and our smartphones, it all operates on the same principle as slot machines and their intermittent variable rewards. As somebody's liking or commenting on whatever we post on Facebook, someone's sharing our post, if we get a text message or someone messages, us through Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp, or we score points in a video game. All these things are little rewards. This technology has been highly engineered to engage, to trigger our brain's dopamine reward mechanism. So what happens is we're getting these like repeated little rewards we get these little pleasurable sensations, these rewards, and so it creates this reinforcement. It's like the experiments way back, Russian physiologist Ivan Pavlov, where he would uh, give dogs a small amount of food and he would ring the bell and the dogs would he could determine that they were salivating. And he continued that for a while. And then at some point, he would ring the bell. And even without giving them any food, the dogs would salivate. So he paired that stimulus of ringing the bell with, they got the idea at some deep level that, oh, it's I'm going to be fed now. <laughs> There's a similar phenomenon that happens as we spend more and more time online, as we use our cell phones. Again, our devices, our smartphones or tablets and our social media platforms, whether it's uh, Facebook or Twitter or Instagram and people liking and sharing our posts. And it continually fires off that uh, uh, dopamine. There's a problem with that too, is that it's also throwing off our brain's own natural biochemical balance, the balance of neurotransmitters. An unfortunate thing about that is as the biochemical balance gets thrown off, it's altering the way our brains function. So instead of being able to focus, we're losing our capacity for deep introspection. Our mind tends to jump 
from one thing to another to another. It's like our minds just skitter along the surface of reality. It makes us shallow. It makes our minds, our brains go all over the place. So it is both. It's changed the brain's biochemistry, but it's also altering the neurons or the neurocircuitry of our brains. And so there's this like scattering and it's disastrous because children have trouble focusing. It makes it difficult for children to learn in school. From early childhood, children are getting smartphones and tablets and they're also staring into the television and all the intense, highly charged imagery designed to be more captivating, more engaging, to suck us in, and all the vivid sound, all these things combined, and it, it just gets incredibly distracting, addictive, and it's making a mess of our brains, and it's making it so much harder for us to focus, and it's creating an addiction. And when we think about the amount of screen time, the amount of time that we spend on our smartphones and other devices, I think the average is something like three to four hours. Average amount of time that most of us spend on our smartphones, we're scrolling, swiping on dating apps and streaming movies and all kinds of other content. But when you combine tablets and computers, all the devices that we use, the total, I think it adds up to something like six to eight hours. For those of us who work behind the screens of our computers, which I happen to be one of those individuals now since I have to do all this work online, that could easily go up to 10, 11 hours. And then you have countries like Japan and South Korea. I'm pretty sure China falls into that category too. Years ago when I spent time in China. I would see these guys and it just seemed like they lived in the internet cafes. <laughs> but that's an enormous portion of our lives that we're staring at our screens. And it's unfortunate because we're not as engaged with one another as we used to be. Once texting became available, I don't remember what year that is, but for many texting became the primary mode of communication. So with texting, it's like you can hear the sound of the other person's voice, no eye contact. It's easy to misconstrue what the other person is saying or, or the supposed meaning of their text. With all this technology, we're hiding behind the screens of our devices. We're just not engaged with one another. And that's retarding our development socially, interpersonally, we're just not showing up. We're not present. We're not paying attention. And so sadly, because of that, so many of us were starved for that human connection as people have become more and more inaccessible. And I've found myself doing this too. It's because you, a lot of times there's no one there. And so what do you do? You go back on your computer or you're scrolling through your smartphone and checking news updates or your social media feed. And it, and it sucks because so many of us, as I said, we're starving for human connection. I noticed these changes occurring gradually, but it got progressively worse over time as people were spending more and more time online. As I said, years ago, when I first went into Boston, I'd go into town, I would have two to three weeks of appointments scheduled even before getting there. And what remaining openings I have would fill up. But as time went on, it changed. And pe people became more and more distracted. It became more commonplace for people to show up in my classes. Oh, before, like, I could do maybe one or just a few event, promotional events, like I would do a radio interview, I could do one or a few classes. But for the most part, my practice just sustained itself. Uh, the same people would come back. I got more referrals. 
And there is this continuity and consistency. My life was a whole lot easier, but my life got a whole lot harder because I ended up having to work four, eight, 10 times harder. It's like having to take a second job because people were so horribly distracted. And what I noticed with people is that as time went on, it, it got to where it was more and more difficult for people to access their emotions. A lot of people, they became more and more disconnected from their bodies, disconnected from their feelings. People were becoming less and less self-aware. And if they couldn't access their feelings, you know, it was creating this weird disconnect within people. When people can't access their feelings, they don't process their emotional responses they're not processing their emotional responses, then all that stress and all the emotions that they're so numbed out to and disconnected from, then it just backs up in their bodies. And then that increases the rate of anxiety and depression, all that emotion and stress, the hurt or confusion or disappointment, this whole range of emotions, anger. You don't process these emotions and they just end up backing up in your body. The more those emotions accumulate, the greater the backlog. What happens is you end up feeling anxious or depressed or overwhelmed, partly because we were never taught how to work effectively with our emotions. Anyway, when we're sitting in front of our devices and we have all this intense, vivid, graphic in imagery, and all the accompanying sound, all this highly charged, but I don't know what else to call it, stimulus, the visual component, the sound component. Like if you're working in a place and it's loud, there's all these people, and they're talking and maybe there's music in the background, hours and hours, and it just wears you out. By the end of the day, you just feel exhausted. And so when you're sitting in front of your computer or your smartphone, and then you're ingesting all this, what is it, videos and Instagram posts and reels and TikToks or you're streaming movies and you're gaming. It's this constant barrage of stimulus. It's flooding in through your sensory channels. And as you continue to do that hour after hour, your body mind is responding. You're taking in that stimulus on some level. It's overwhelming your body and mind, your brain's processing capacity. You cannot possibly process all that digital input. And so what happens since you cannot process it, it creates this noise, the static, and that just builds up inside of your body. What I notice working with people, in addition to the normal accumulation of stress and the emotions that people don't process, there's all this additional garbage sitting in the body in the form of this noise and static from all this digital input, Facebook posts and TikToks and uh, Instagram. As that noise and static accumulates, what happens is it, it overburdens our systems, makes it more difficult. There's a numbing effect. There's a deadening effect. There's a shutting down. It creates more of that disconnect. And so people are becoming more disconnected from their own emotions, more disconnected from their bodies. It's harder for them to feel. There's less self-awareness. And what I have found working with people, it's like they end up disconnecting from that inner core being. So there's more and more their focus is drawn outwards into their devices, into their smartphones and tablets and computers. And so people are less present in the moment. They are less present to themselves. And that's really tragic. The makers of our devices, our smartphones, our tablets, our computers, social media platforms, 
Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, they're all highly engineered, as I said. They're designed to be addictive as hell. They want you to be spending as many hours of your day as possible on their platforms and also using their devices because the more we do so, the more we're likely to view advertisements. And as we view advertisements, then we're spending more dollars on those products that are advertised. And so you know, Facebook, they get, they get a lot more ad revenue. Advertisers spend more money, kick more money into Facebook. So we, the consumers of Facebook, we are the product. We are being exploited. And as I said, someone likes her post or shares her post. And but other features like infinite scroll, everything is designed to keep us on longer. This bottomless feed, we keep scrolling further and further down. And the dating apps, again, everything's designed according to the principles of intermittent variable rewards. Like occasionally we're going along and maybe we feel a little bored or emptied, but on a dating app, somebody matches with us. Oh, now we got a message from that person. Maybe we get a date sometimes. Dating apps also create fake profiles, especially they create fake female profiles so that the guys will stay on. They think they got a connection. Our phones, devices, dating apps, social media, they're designed to exploit us, to enrich the people who developed these platforms and our devices. So again, we find ourselves caught up in this whole addictive cycle. It's so important for us to be making a concerted effort to be mindful of our use of technology to decrease the time we spend on our devices. I have to set limits. I mean, I'm human, vulnerable too, to this exploitation. You know, they have whole teams of engineers that very calculating, figuring out how they can keep you on these apps and devices for longer and longer. We need to be especially mindful about the amount of time that we spend on our devices and that we spend on either dating apps or social media. So whatever we can do. My smartphone is a Google Pixel 6. And one of the things that I like best about the Pixel is it has this feature called Extreme Battery Saver. Extreme Battery Saver allows me to shut off just about everything. All the apps, they're there if I want, like if there was some major something blowing up and I want to find out what happened. I follow the war in, U in Ukraine. I want to see them provide <laughs> missiles and whatever it takes to get the Russians the fuck out of Ukraine. And it's painful for me to see what's happening, but I have to be mindful about how much time I'm spending online. So I limit the amount of time that I will look at news. I usually reserve that till later in the day after I've gotten a lot of work done. Otherwise, I sit, I'm looking at news and then it's altering my brain and I lose my focus. I can't pay attention and I'm distracted and hours go by and it's a disaster. I'm not near as productive. So I have to be very mindful and say, okay, I'm not going to let myself look at that until later in the day. As I said, with the extreme battery saver, I can't see news updates. I don't get anything from Facebook or any other notifications. Only thing I get is Messenger and WhatsApp and text and phone calls. That's about it. And the good thing about that is if someone really needs to reach out to me, I'll get the notification and I could respond to them. But otherwise, I block it out. And that's so important because here we are going through a day. We have whatever task, whether we're working or maybe we could be out on a date with somebody or spending time with a friend. And we're getting these incessant notifications. And what it does is it, it keeps distracting us. We're here in the moment with our friend, our, our date, or maybe a family member, or we're concentrating on some task. We're at work 
are for me, I spend hours writing, but you keep getting these incessant notifications, a new Facebook post, another text. Well, I do get the text, but, but for the most part, I tell people, please don't text me, call me if you really need to communicate. And that cuts down on the amount of notifications too. But all these constant notifications, it destroys our concentration. It destroys our ability to focus, to pay attention. It fucks with our brains. And so the more that we can cut down on the notifications, they're constantly pumping out these notifications. They want your attention. They want your focus. But in doing so, as I said, it's destroying your ability to focus. It's altering the way our brains function, and that's really disastrous for us. And so we need to be especially mindful. We need to be careful so that we have healthy, as least as healthy as possible habits when it comes to our use of digital technology. I do enjoy the technology to to some extent. I mean, we all benefit from it to some extent because I think about years ago, I, I called a friend in Argentina before making a trip down there. I wasn't on the phone that long. It cost me $90. Now we got WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger. I talked to friends back in India and Sri Lanka, different parts of Europe, other parts of the world, anytime I want, and it's free. And I can talk as long as I want with them. Facebook has been wonderful. Like I've been able to reconnect with friends that I lost touch with from years ago. With Facebook, for instance, as long as they maintain an account, I can be traveling. I could be working my ass off for hours on end and months and years could go by even. And I look and it's like, oh, he or she is still there. And I could message them or they message me every now and then, or we call one another. And it, it really helps to stay in touch. Having spent so much time in Sri Lanka and I'd be staying in the former war zone in the north of the country and I'd be out in these remote areas and Google Maps. I, I'd go for long ass walks. I'd be on these dirt roads and I could see exactly where I was going with Google Maps. And so I didn't get lost anywhere in the United States or Europe or wherever, you know, other parts of Asia or Africa, wherever you have Google Maps, you can navigate if you need to walk or drive somewhere. It's tremendously helpful. And it'll even tell you public transportation that you can take. And so there, there are many advantages to technology. I have mixed feelings about the dating apps. It does help some people to connect, but it's unfortunate because we have these dating apps is that people are you get lazy and and because it's still culturally expected to some extent that men initiate and because a lot of men have faced brutal rejections many are afraid to initiate it's much easier to hide behind the screens of your smartphone or computer and attempt to connect through dating apps <clears throat> but we're failing to develop crucial interpersonal skills when we're able to see someone and maybe initially we find them attractive or find something about them that we like or appreciate. And when we approach those individuals and we engage them, we start conversations and maybe we end up going out with them or spending time getting to know them. That is a very crucial part of our own personal, interpersonal, or social development. And so when we're on these dating apps, then we're not developing those crucial skills and we're missing out on a hugely important part of our development. But also with these dating apps, we keep swiping and it seems like there's this supposedly endless sea of potential partners and we don't value people as much. And because they're on these dating apps, in some ways, people are just not as real to us. Because of that, there's more of this disconnect. We're not as deeply connected. We don't quite form the emotional bonds that we need to form for relationships to truly develop. Sometimes it happens. I know people who've 
found the love of their life on dating apps and their people have been together for years or decades now. But there's a lot of ghosting and it can be a, a very painful, lonely, disastrous experience. And a lot of people feel exploited. So I, I feel it's very important for us to, as much as possible, we need to get back to connecting with people in real life. Before, my practice pretty much maintained itself. But as people became more and more distracted, I had to start offering classes on a weekly basis. I was doing every week in New York and then commuting to Boston every other week and doing classes up there. And when I first started using Meetup to promote my classes, 60 to 80 percent of the people who signed up would show up to my classes. Over time, it was getting worse and worse. It got to where it was 20 to 30 percent of people showing up and it was very frustrating very painful at times because he's put in all this time and effort and there was expense on my part and then as i said people would show up in class or show up for appointments a time or two and then disappear so i just had to just continually bust my ass to reach more and more people other practitioners i talk with too they've they express the same grief the pain Frustration. There is a movement therapist I was speaking with a couple of months ago, and she was saying something to the effect of how she used to work with a lot of the same people for years, and many would come in twice a week. She said now she's lucky if she can get them to to commit to even five sessions. That, that people just show up and disappear. There's this high attrition rate. It's hard for me to keep up with all the specifics as far as times and dates, but you see YouTube shorts, Instagram, Facebook reels and TikToks. Now we have these incredibly short videos, usually ranging between 15 seconds and up to three minutes. But for the most part, they're trying to keep them under a minute because you have to be under a minute to, to go on YouTube as a short. And the shorts are generating the most traffic. The shorts are enabling content creators to build their following. And because I'm dealing with this reality too, it forces me to jump in and swim in this ecosystem that digital technology, that online content providers have created. But again, it's fucking with our brains. Many of us, and some people still do this, but we were growing up and we had parents and grandparents sitting in front of the, the television and they're just flipping from one channel to the next. And here we were watching these shorts and reels and TikToks and it, it's like we're jumping from one reality to another and all this intense, vivid, highly charged imagery and sound input and it's jacking with our brains the, the way our brains function it's exacerbating our ability to concentrate to focus it's basically creating digital adhd that's disastrous when it comes to our ability to learn our ability to focus our ability to retain information there's a great book that I highly recommend, the, the Shallows. What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains, it's by Nicholas Carr. I, I highly encourage you to read that book. I think it's at least 10 or 11 years old, but he was seeing what was happening like way back there, and it's still relevant to this day. There's numerous other books that have come out. Let's see, Nir Eyal wrote a book, Indistractable. There's another book, Irresistible the rise of addictive technology and the business of keeping us hooked. There are a number of books that are coming out because you need to educate yourself about this. We all need to be as educated as possible. But here we get into this cycle of digital addiction and it's just leaving us hungry and more disconnected from one another, more disconnected from ourselves, from our emotions. We're less self-aware. We're disconnected from this inner core being. Again, I see the impact of this technology and the way people approach healing now 
it's like a lot of people, as I said, they'll come in, they'll do a session, they'll do maybe a few, and people are so impatient. They just want these like instantaneous results and healings is not going to work like that. And a lot of people too, they're turning to Instagram and TikTok, the posts they're reading on Instagram and the shorts and the reels. And that's like their form of ther therapy. They're looking for these insights and revelations and it's all this pop psychology and there's a lot of it that's really inaccurate. So many of their issues are not being addressed. The problems are not being resolved. They persist. And then people are so distracted and so disconnected. Again, they can't access their emotions. They're not processing. They're not resolving issues. They're not able to really focus and commit themselves in the way they need to to really arrive at a solution to solve the problems. We all need to be doing things to counteract our use of digital technology. I'm backtracking a little bit here, but I spend a couple of hours a day meditating. And that's so important because doing the meditation, it's like a reset for the brain. It helps to offset our use of this distractive technologies. That's what it is, distractive technology. And there are other things. Get out, spend time with friends, with family. Maybe you don't have as many friends to spend time with. Maybe you can use Meetup or whatever you can find to help you find out more about different events or things going on and get out to where people are meeting and engage, meet new people, find out about causes or issues that you're passionate about and then go out and get involved animal rescue volunteer time at an animal shelter other issues or causes that are important maybe political or helping to care for elderly people humanitarian organizations that help refugees all kinds of things you could get involved in. But even just getting out, uh, spending time in nature, going hiking, or even going out for a walk, biking, swimming, we need that physical activity, especially if it gets us outside. Uh, the more we do that, it helps to offset the damaging influences of these distractive technologies. Now, when it comes to healing, like I said, a lot of people, it's like they have these totally unrealistic unre expectations. I think they're going to heal in, in a, a session or two, and that's just not going to happen. I spent years training with Horace Dokai, one of the last surviving traditional doctors among the Kiowa Indian tribe. Horace passed on portions of his own healing gifts to me. And and then he had me go on the vision quest. Now, typically the vision quest, it's a Native American practice. You go out four days and nights to fast alone in the mountains. You're not eating, you're not drinking. And that's how you earn the right to work with these gifts of healing and you receive additional gifts. So I work as a conduit, allowing an extraordinarily powerful presence to work through me. As I work with people, what I find is that initially the first few sessions, one through three, a lot of people's bodies, there's a lot of numbing, a lot of disconnect. There's years and years, often decades of stress, stagnant, unprocessed emotional content. All this stuff is just backed up in people's bodies. So initially, first few sessions, people may not be all that aware of the changes occurring. Some people are. Some people may have strong emotions surfacing and it can be very uncomfortable, but these emotions need to surface. They need to come up. They need to be processed. So the first few sessions are just clearing this backlog of stagnation. We continue the clearing as we get into sessions three, four, five, six. There's more clearing. The body is beginning at that point to become more responsive more fluid. So there becomes more of an interactive quality. The body actually responds to this extraordinarily powerful presence that's working through me. And then as we get into sessions five, six, seven, eight, through 10, even beyond, that's when 
there's this incredible level of engagement taking place within the body. From my standpoint, it feels as though the molecules are spreading out and just oscillating. Some people, as I'm working with them, they feel this presence going into the body. They feel this reconstruction, a reconstructive process. I'm working with people with digestive disorders like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, or irritable bowel syndrome. And say someone who's experiencing all this pain and passing blood in their stools, working with them, and it facilitates the healing of their digestive tract. And they get to where they're no longer in pain or passing blood, and they could eat pretty much whatever they want, within reason, of course. And working with people with respiratory disorders like asthma and people with sports injuries or those injured in automobile accidents, including even traumatic brain injuries, helping people who have suffered stroke, heart disease, like a wide range of conditions. And that's as we get into sessions five, six, seven, eight, ten, and beyond. That's when the body becomes so responsive. And then the the deep, profound transformation that occurs on an emotional level. People struggling with anxiety and depression, patterns of abandonment, rejection, unrequited love, those who have gone through a devastating breakup. And you see them just move through it. They're able to digest all those painful, heart-rending ordeals they've gone through and all those painful, highly charged emotions. And they get to where they're bouncing back and they're letting go of those unhealthy attachments. And I see many of these same individuals, they move on to attract into their life companions with whom they can truly love and be loved by. When you really give this healing process the opportunity to to do what it can do for you, it's building a much stronger healthier foundation. It's increasing your processing capacity so that you could actually digest your life experiences. You could handle your emotions. You can just chew them up. You could digest all that. And you learn and you grow your life experiences and your emotions. It all becomes fuel for your continued growth. You become that much more present. You become more alive. It it, engages that creative problem-solving capacities within your brain so that you arrive at all kinds of workable solutions. A lot to think about here. Oh, by the way, which I should have mentioned earlier, click like, share the video if you know other people that can benefit, subscribe to my channel. If you resonate with what I have to say here, feel free to reach out to me. If you're struggling, if you're going through a difficult time in your relationship, or you've either dealing with these patterns of abandonment, unrequited love, if you're have you're in the midst of, or you've gone through a breakup or some other heartrending ordeal, if you're facing health-related challenges, reach out to me if I could be of assistance. For a limited time, I have a certain amount of time I can make available for it. And we can just talk if I could. If there are other things that I feel will benefit, I'll be happy to pass that on. And if I could be of assistance to you, I will share that with you as well. I think I've covered most of what I need to for today. And Uh, Stay tuned for other videos. Uh, Bye for now.